Good evening, everyone. My name is Laura Malone, and I'm your host this evening. And welcome to Healing Developmental Disruptions, an introduction to body dynamics, somatic developmental psychology. So first about body dynamics. For those of you who are, who are familiar with Raja Selvam's work, he's uh, pretty well known in the somatic psychology field. He said, body dynamics is probably the most exacting body-oriented and comprehensive developmental psychology and character structure model there is. So that's a ringing endorsement. And then Babette Rothschild, if you do work with trauma, you're probably familiar with her work. She's uh, a pioneer in the area of trauma. And she says, the body dynamic model of seven developmental stages is the most sensible, comprehensive, easily applicable and accessible personality theory that I have ever encountered. I draw from this incredibly valuable framework every day. In my opinion, it would be hard to find a better training in developmental psychology anywhere. So um, real enthusiasm from experts in the field. So now let me talk about Anne and Joel before I pass this over to them. So Anne and Joel have both been practicing somatic therapy since the late 1970s and have been using body dynamics for over 25 years. They're body dynamic analysts and trainers and have been teaching and developing the work together since 1995. They have led workshops and trainings at the Esalen Institute for two decades and have presented at many conferences, including the U.S. Association of Body Psychotherapists and the European Association of Body Psychotherapists. They were adjunct faculty at Santa Barbara Graduate Institute for seven years and have also taught at California Institute of Integral Studies and JFK University. They've led workshops around the world, including Australia, Uruguay, mm. Denmark, France, Germany, Canada, and they now lead body dynamic trainings in the U.S. and Canada. Joel has published numerous articles in psychology journals. His background in science and his long interest in alternative education have led him to continually explore at deeper levels to make teaching simpler and learning easier. His efforts with the body dynamic material have made it more straightforward for professionals to integrate the work into their own practice. Anne, trained with attachment theorists, including Mary Main and Eric Hess, and one of her unique and significant contributions to body dynamics is the integration of attachment theory into the work. She is also trained in AEDP with Ron Frederick and Diana Fosha. She is a student of Ivan Agazarian system-centered therapy and is influenced by Beryl Tulku and the body-based Buddhist work of Julie Henderson and Tony Richardson. All of this has influenced their approach to body dynamic trainings. So that gives you some information about the depth of their work in this area. And now I am going to turn it over to Anne. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad you could join us. Welcome. And I'd like to start with an overview of body dynamics. Body dynamics is a very refined and precise way to use the body to make verbal psychotherapy very effective. And what we mean by refined and precise is that the people who develop body dynamics map the muscles that come into developmental uh, become active become active at, at, at each stage of development and know that the, know what these muscles are that people use for psychological as well as somatic reasons and by and they know what muscles need to be used to help people develop more resources that they're missing it's a developmental model that works with the correspondence between physical and psychological functioning for instance, how does a child say no? Well, initially, the first thing they do to say no when they're infants is just gaze avert. They turn their uh, eyes away from you as a way of trying to set a limit or gather themselves. The second thing they can do when they get a little bit older is they start to be able to turn their head a little bit to turn away from you. The third thing they can do when they're pretty young is if they don't like the way something tastes, they, they spit it out. These are all ways of saying no before they have language. Then, when their uh, muscles become more into, uh, available for voluntary movement, where they can control them, the next way of saying no is to push away with their arms and their hand and to use their legs and push away. These are all ways of saying no before they have words. 
And just like there are ways of saying no before they have words, so on through development, each psychological function has a somatic component that either supports you or doesn't, doesn't allow you to be as effective. So Joel, I think you wanted to talk about it. Yes, thank you, Anne. Uh, so as a result of the research done by the founders of Bodynamics, we now know the psychological function of all the voluntary muscles. We can now use the muscles to train or release specific abilities related to the psychological issue being worked on. And these abilities are generally the ones that were not available in childhood development and whose absence then led to protective behavior and to the developmental disruptions we're talking about today. Uh, we're, <clears throat> we're going to talk about the, the muscles that are physically present in an infant. Uh, all the muscles are there, but they're not available to be uh, used um, voluntarily. As, as the child develops through each stage, different muscles corresponding to the different movements and themes of that stage come under voluntary control. These enable the child to do movements and attain the corresponding psychological abilities. One of the examples would be, say, crawling, and the ability the child then has is to follow its impulses. And we also will talk about uh, the difference between traumatic and non-traumatic disruptions and how they're encoded differently in the body and different parts of the nervous system. We're also going to explain to you uh, the difference between a rigid or a collapsed defense and how it shows up in the muscles, not just in our, our psychological ways of protecting ourselves. And using the themes, you'll learn how using the themes of the developmental stages can help build the therapeutic relationship. When you know the time period that someone has had some sort of developmental disruption, you know how to speak to them in a way that supports what they didn't get when they were a child. And we'll also be giving you examples of sessions at, towards the end of the, of the seminar. So something about the history and background of Bodynamics. Um, Bodynamics is originally the work of a collective of 12 Danish therapists who shared and worked together for over 20 years. They did a large amount of empirical investigation to find the psychological function of each muscle. They correlated over 10,000 reports of sessions, both from client and therapist. The reports included what muscles were used, what psychological issues were evoked, and what age range seemed to be involved. They also did detailed observational research of children to correlate motor movements and new psychological skills. After collecting these huge amount of data, the Danes put it together in a wonderful description of childhood development. This description is contained in our model of seven developmental stages. These overlapping stages cover the ages from before birth to 12 years. This information is now available in the book, Body Encyclopedia by Lisbeth Marcher and Sonia Fisch. Uh, as you can see from this illustration, Bodynamics is taught globally. In the USA, it's been taught repeatedly in the San Francisco and LA areas, and also taught in Boulder, Austin, New York, and Charlotte, North Carolina. Some of these are places where an organizer has invited us to come and train. Okay. And who, who uses body dynamics? Well, lots of people. Psychotherapists, of course, and other mental health workers, uh, advanced body workers, and um, the, uh, some of our trainees have included medical doctors, chiropractors, and coaches who work developmentally. The training is also very useful for people who work with expecting parents and parents of young children. And one of our trainees was a, a therapist in a school, and she brought some of the ideas back, and the school changed their way of teaching. Okay. 
So mutual connection, this is the organizing principle of body dynamics. And if you look at this photo, this is a wonderful example of mutual connection. These two, these two human beings obviously delight in each other and are so happy to be together. So what is mutual connection? Uh, there's a phrase that body dynamics use, which is when I am all of me and you are all of you, can we be in deep connection? Well, here the answer is definitely yes. And all, because all of our functioning is learned in relationship, it's, the result is uh, a result of whether it's a good connection or the lack of it and whether the skills are learned or whether they're not learned. We look, if we look at these general principles, again, relationship is the context for development. We're too, when, we, when we come in, we're, too, we're, we, we, we're too helpless to be able to like, figure out how to regulate our needs. So for the first structure, time structure is, you know, can I get, can I get enough contact and can I get a, t a tuned enough caretaker to help me learn that my needs can be met? As these resources and abilities are learned, different motor and psychological development is also happening at the same time. And disruptions stem from a lack of support to develop uh, and, and result in a lack of developed resources. Each developmental time has a particular theme. As I said, the first one need is about can I get my needs met? Later on, there's a sense of can I follow my impulses? Later on, it's can I follow my intentions? So these themes all contain the um, psychological goals, but also all the different tasks that are included in that. And looking at the different muscles that correspond to these goals and tasks gives us a map of, of what actually happened to that child during development. And our approach uh, stems from the fact that psychological problems are not really solved, they're resolved when the person has the ability uh, needed to resolve them. So the psychological function um, of a muscle becomes available to work with when an issue is current in a, a client's life. If a client lacks an ability related to the area they want to change, or if they have resolved, resigned behavior in this area, we have them tense the related muscle while learning the ability. Then we'll have them practice it with us till it becomes available. On the other hand, if the ability is held back or um, acted on in a rigid way, we work with stretching the muscle. This releases the holding back and then they can practice with us how to act in more flexible ways. We've also found that we can free most long-standing historical patterns by working only in the here and now. We work with a person's history only when we feel it's needed. Okay. So, what do resources look like? Well, here's a kid who obviously is feeling pretty resourced. Looks like something happened. He's feeling pretty proud. Something good. Yeah, I, I did it. I did it. That's what a resource looks for him. Another way a resource might look is if a kid can feel like their opinion really counts, or I can come out with my power, or I know what I need and I can ask for help. Or when I'm excited, I can follow my impulses. Or I'm comfortable being myself in a group. These are all themes from several different uh, developmental stages. And a resource happens when there's, an, there's a good amount of support uh, in this nascent development so that the skills get learned and supported and they keep developing until there's a sense of competency. What happens when there's not a, um, enough support is that these ruptures can occur. Now, ruptures don't necessarily have to lead to a developmental disruption. Ruptures, if they're repaired, can help you uh, develop more of a trusting relationship. But when there are too many ruptures and there's not enough repair, that's when we have these developmental disruptions. So here's an example of a resourced person. Here's a woman that is so centered that she can hold on to herself in a totally relaxed and present way, even though there's so much activity around her. 
that's a very strong sense of your inner self. And the only time there might be a problem is what if the reason everybody's going in the other direction is they're all leaving Dodge because there's a stampede behind them and she's so centered she doesn't notice it. Now, obviously, that's not happening here. But what if that would be being too centered? And next slide, not grounded enough. Being grounded means being in contact with the outer reality and the ability to take in support. So if we look at this beautiful child, we see how comfortable they are lying on the ground, getting that support and feeling totally relaxed in their own body. At the same time, someone is actually making some very nice contact with them. And they're very, they're very fascinated and pleased with that contact. So they're taking in support, not just from the ground, but from somebody else. That's really being in touch with your outer reality. Good enough mutual connection creates resources. Well, we can look at this slide and say, oh yeah, this is good enough mutual connection. These people obviously are delighting in each other. And what's happening when, when that occurs between a parent and a child is something happens, not just in your mind that you feel this security and you feel this sense of belonging, but you also have a sense of being in your body and being relaxed and alive. Examples of resources include being in touch with your own inner experience, which we were talking about a minute ago as centering, being in touch with outer reality, which is really being grounded, having self-support, being able to reach out for what you need, being able to take a stand and set a limit, being able to express yourself, being aware of yourself, and having a sense of resiliency. Good enough mutual connection creates all these resources. We have a sense that we're in this together. The child knows that they have the support when they need it and they have the space when they need it. Next slide. Developmental disruptions. So as I was saying earlier, a lack of attunement doesn't have to lead to a developmental disruption unless it's consistent and repeated and there's no repair. So during childhood, Physical, cognitive, and emotional development is affected by these non-traumatic developmental disruptions. Children learn to protect themselves in order to hold on to the relationship with the adult. They give up some part of themselves. Or the other thing could happen. They hold on to some part of themselves and let go of some of the relationship. These protective responses become the sources of the issues that adults come into therapy for. The client comes in talking about an issue, and, but, they're, but, but these things we know are reflecting abilities that were not learned or accepted when they were very young. For instance, in the autonomy stage of, a, of development, the child has all kinds of energy and curiosity and wants to explore the world. If they have a parent who really gets anxious, one, if they separate, two, if they're impulsive and do whatever they want to do, uh, and, for, and can't handle that kind of new behavior in their child, the child might learn that that's not okay. And what they would do then is sort of hold their impulses back and wait until it was okay, until they got the okay sign from their parents. That would be a very early position. And the people who come into therapy with that, that kind of a, a, an adult who would who look like that, might come into therapy and really not know how to follow, not even to identify impulses, but certainly know how to follow it. And they might want you to tell them what to do in therapy. Um, a, a lighter uh, developmental disruption for autonomy could be just a parent who can't handle a lot of energy and excitement. Suppose there's someone sick, or suppose they just don't like a lot of noise. So every time their kids get enthusiastic and start getting excited about things, calm down, that's too much. If you want to do that, go outside, whatever, whatever it is. The child learns to keep the relationship. They can't get too excited. So as adults, they might get anxious when, the, when people are getting excited and dancing and singing. It might be too much energy for them. So that would be a lesser uh, uh, rupture, but still something that's a developmental disruption. Yes, uh, and uh, one of the things we wanted to do was 
to distinguish between developmental disruptions and trauma and how they're held in the body. Uh, from the work of leading figures like Peter Levine and Bessel van der Kolk, we know that traumatic experiences are imprinted primarily in the autonomic nervous system, the involuntary nervous system, and their best work within specific ways. Uh, by contrast, developmental disruptions result from lesser but repeated parental responses. Uh, these are imprinted in the voluntary nervous system and in the muscles and in the mind. And again, these are what we're discussing here today. So here we're looking at the body NAMIC seven developmental stages. <laughs> and as you can see, these children actually, well, you might know it, but I know, they represent, they really represent uh, children at the ages that these stages uh, are, are going on in life. So the first one is existence. Do I have the right to exist? The second one is need. That little baby obviously is getting her needs met for contact and for food. I was just speaking about autonomy. It's really about following your impulses. And this baby is pretty, pretty out there with, yeah, this is fun and I'm going to do it. Next stage is will structure. Here's this little industrious kid who's following her intentions. I'm going to, I'm going to help mow the lawn. And look at these little sweeties in love sexuality. They're comfortable with their loving feelings. They're also comfortable with their contact with each other physically. Next one is opinion structure. That happens between the ages of six and nine. It's when kids go to school and they start to be seen as being able to think and being seen as being able to have opinions. They're forming their own opinions because they start to recognize that the values and norms that they grew up with might be different than the values and norms other people grew up with. And the last stage, which happens between eight and 12, is performance and solidarity. And it really has to do with how we function in groups. Can I be a leader in a group? Can I be a follower in the group? Or am I too anxious to do either? And I just sort of disappear? Or do I avoid groups altogether? So I wanted to talk a little bit about opinion structure and give an example of what can cause a healthy opinion structure. Suppose a kid comes home, as I did, and I, this is, you can tell I'm old because I'm going to say that I learned the um, pledge allegiance to the flag. So I came home and told my parents I had just learned the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. And I went on and said what it was, and I said, one nation, under God, invisible, with liberty and justice for all. And my mom said, I don't think that's quite right, Anne. It's, I think it's one nation, under God, indivisible. I said, no, that's not what my teacher told me, and it's one nation, under God, invisible. So that was an opinion, and because she didn't, like, come down on me, how could you say that, or you don't know what you're talking about, I could hold on to that opinion. So, but what if she had come down? What if I had said one nation under God, invisible, and she had said, Anne, that's terrible, that's not how you say it, and besides that, you're too little to really know what that's all about. Why don't you just forget about it? That could lead me to go, oh, okay, well, okay, I won't express my opinion about that. I won't be excited about what I'm learning. And later on in life, what I might do is when I have an opinion is do something without, and I won't, I, I don't feel safe to express it. I might do something like this. Now that's a nonverbal saying I have an opinion, but I'm not using my words. On the other hand, if someone has a late opinion structure, what happens with them is that they they got contact, they got a lot of contact for coming forward with their opinions. And what they might do is to really argue all the time because that's where they think they're getting contact. So they're expressing their opinions right and left and it might not be a way to make contact at all. In fact, they may be pushing people away. Next. So imprinting. So imprinting is how this interaction becomes encoded in the body and the mind. Now, what's significant about this is we actually can't reach into the mind and really test what happened. But what's amazing about the imprinting in the muscles is that we can touch them and we can have direct contact with how, how the imprinting is embedded. 
And that's pretty much what's so, um, so wonderful about the work we're doing is that we can, we can actually touch the part where uh, the somatic part of how this protection is in the body. Muscles become imprinted depending on the, uh, the attunement of the caretakers and how well a new movement or expression is accepted. The child's reactions to the repeated parental responses is imprinted. As we've said, good enough leads to a psychological resource. Failure in attunement and support leads to developmental disruptions. And the, what, as, we were, as I was talking about earlier, there's, a, there's an early position, a resignation, which leads to an under elasticity in the muscle. And as therapists, we can actually feel that. And the person can actually sense it because those muscles don't have much life in them. That's something that really hasn't been learned. On the other hand, if it's a, a later developmental disruption in this particular time period, the muscle has an over elasticity and we can actually sense that when you, when you and they can sense it. The muscle is tight. They, they feel tense a lot. They don't like to move it so much. So that's what a more rigid expression, which is related to uh, having to hold back something that your parents didn't like. Next. Uh, this illustration shows the uh, psychological functions of different muscles in different areas of the body and how the, uh, there's a correlation with parts of the body and psychological function. For example, then on the top left, you'll see that the neck muscles are related to orientation, to willpower, to pride, and to keeping one's head. These functions are often closer to consciousness and thus to common awareness. One more would be the shoulder elevators, carrying burdens. We're familiar with the expression, she carries the weight of the world on her shoulders. Well, that means that at some time, people really understood that um, the shoulders are used to when one feels one has to carry a burden and tension in there is uh, used in that situation. So there's more in this and if, uh, if you're interested uh, in more of this, you can look on our website, the front and back uh, full diagrams are available there. So I wanted to say one more thing that I actually uh, didn't mention about the, the uh, Body Dynamics 7 developmental stages. This didn't come out of thin air. Um, they, what, they, what they did, what, and what's nice about these Body Dynamic 7 developmental stages, is that the, Dan the Danes who developed this work were very familiar with the uh, Reich's theories, with Bowlby's theories, with uh, Margaret Mahler's, with Freud. And they incorporated all of that knowledge into their knowledge of somatic development. Um, and, and the developmental stages that they, uh, what they named and what they looked at uh, was done in a non-pathological way. It's done, if we look at these developmental stages, we see that it really talks about what the, what the developmental task is. And it really, it really respects the decisions the child made to either hold on to themselves or try and hold on to the relationship as best as possible. Okay, and we can go back to uh, the resource or healthy outcome. So again, if there's a good enough acceptance and support. The child has a resiliency in their body. They feel comfortable expressing themselves with the tasks that are, that are needed, um, whatever they're trying to do. They, the muscles are available, and they, they have um, a resource that they probably know about. They probably know that they're comfortable with it. But the other thing is that you can, have a re you can be in a resource uh, stage. You could have a resource position, but not actually know that you have those resources. And that's something that would come up in therapies to really help people understand, hey, you're really good at this. And they might not know it, but part of therapy would be to help them accept it and understand it. Okay. So along with the resource position, if the uh, parental um, uh, response was good enough, there are some other positions which are result from the parental response being not so good. 
So if acceptance and encouragement were absent or negative uh, early on in the developmental stage, then um, the abilities would not be learned or they might be given up. And um, the muscle in this case will be under elastic and the corresponding psychological ability will not be available. Uh, if this is true for that stage in general, then we have what we call an early position for that stage. And uh, this, um, th we'll talk more about that. And in a parallel way, if the acceptance and encouragement are there for a while and then withdrawn, the muscle will be over elastic and the psychological function will be held back or acted on in a rigid way. And if this is true in a general first stage, we call this a late position. So there are three possible positions for each developmental stage. And this adds to the complexity, but it also gives, a, gives us a lot of flexibility in using the muscles. Okay. So here we have the early and late positions again. We're looking at for instance, will structure. So will structure is when a child, this is age two to four, when they're learning to come out with their power, they're learning to be able to make plans, they're learning to come with their intentions. This is very different from autonomy, which is all about impulse. Whatever's in front of me is what I engage with, and when it's not there, it's sort of out of sight, out of mind. So will structure is when we start to develop a sense of object, constancy is well it starts in autonomy but really have that in will so we know that uh, if mom goes away she hasn't disappeared in will structure we really able to come out with plans I want to do this and then I want to do that if there's a rupture or a, a, enough of ruptures at this stage from the er, from for the early position we call it self-sacrificing this is and this could start with the best of intentions because they can start from altruism for instance, if a, par if a parent is sick and the young child wants to help out, they might really start to be a caretaker for their parents in ways that might not be appropriate. And if that happens in a, in a, for a long time in a, or a lot, they can really get stuck in a self-sacrificing role where they continually give up themselves to take care of others and hope that that's going to give them the contact that they want. They don't follow their own intention. They, they try and take their lead from you. The, the later position in will structure has to do with being judgmental. And what we mean by judgmental is the child is very, very strongly, uh, 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 clearly saying, you know, I don't like that and I don't like you. Now that's going to happen for kids this age anyway, but when they get older, they can get stuck in that role and be very rigid about what's right and what's wrong and what they want to do and what they have to do. Uh, and they can be very blaming. So if there's a problem, it's your fault. Um, and that can be, for an adult, that can lead to a lot of relationship problems. Uh, what's interesting is that this person, the person who's in the judgmental position, often picks a partner who's in the self-sacrificing position because that person believes, if there's a problem, it must be my fault. So they get stuck in these roles with each other, and it can uh, be pretty hard to unwind until both of them become aware of the fact that they're really stuck in a role. Okay. So here we're going on to body dynamic therapy. What does it look like? Okay. Um, in a very basic way, um, what we do in therapy is um, develop resources, build a relationship and support our client to build a competency so they have the ability to resolve the issue in their life. Okay. So now we'll talk about a framework of a session so you get an idea of what we try to do with clients. Um, this outline pulls together much of what we've been talking about. And uh, so we can see that uh, what we do is work on an issue um, with a client. We agree on an issue with them that they want to change. Uh, we get some examples of what that is, so we're really clear and they're clear about what the behavior is. 
And we talk a little bit about what change might look like in, in the future. Um, so we, as we said before, we work in the here and now, we work in the present and only bring in the person's history when it's necessary. So by talking with a client, um, we can get a sense of what developmental stage the issue has probably uh, come from. And uh, that gives us a lot of information and it tells us some of the themes we want to work around. And as we continue to talk and listen and observe any physiological changes in the clients, we will recognize what ability or abilities might be missing. And that is one of the things we have to teach people. These abilities, when we teach them, become resources that allow them to behave differently. Um, so knowing the developmental stage and knowing the, uh, the ability, we can identify the specific muscle for this stage and work with them to evoke the, uh, the abilities and the theme of the stage. Um, I'd like to just put a, a little note in there. Would that sure. be okay? Yes, okay. please. So what I, what I like to, what's amazing to me actually, because it happens a lot and I'm always sort of like, wow, um, is when you work with a muscle, uh, something's happening on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. When you, when you work with a muscle, what starts to happen is that that muscle is like a, when you're, when you're working with, with, with a developmental theme and you're working on an issue somebody wants to work on, the muscles that you start to work with really reflect the time and the issues that, that they were working on. So when you, when you have them use a muscle, you're, it's like getting a hologram into the whole developmental stage. And why I say that is each muscle is different. So if we're working with graphs, for instance, how does, a, how does an infant grasp? They do something like this. And that sort of gives you the feeling of what it's like to be an infant as to what they're, what they're exploring. Whereas if you work with autonomy, autonomy grasp is like this. And they're picking up all these little things and examining them like this. That sort of gives you a whole sense of the autonomy stage of development where there's curiosity, there's not a name for things so much, but, there, but there's a, the grasp reflects what they're doing and how they're organizing their uh, cognitive processes. If you go to will structure, they're grasping things like this. They're grasping hard, they're pushing hard, they're moving things around, they're, they're, they're grasping things in a different way, they're coming out with their power. So that kind of grasp represents what that stage is all about. So that's why I like to say that the muscles reflect the whole stage and can keep you in the structure when you're working with somebody just by using them. So Joel, you wanted to go on to the next thing, but I- Yes, uh, and what you're saying is very good. And uh, sometimes even working with particular muscles from a stage will evoke memories about that stage. That's true. Because you're That's bringing true. up the sort of an ambiance about it and you're relating to the client around the themes of that stage. So we're building muscles, we're relating around the themes and we're giving emotional and physical support. So while we're doing all this, uh, and we're doing it, uh, you know, in a focused way, we don't have any fixed idea where this will lead. It's not like we have an end in mind. In a sense, we're following the person's process, but containing it to the issue and the stage that we're uh, re working with, where, where it developed. Um, and as we work in this way, clients usually find that their impulse to... Uh, use the old protective behavior is greatly diminished or at times it's even absent. They, the new competency supports them to be flexible and to choose new and more appropriate behaviors in the present. So um, uh, let me say something about meta-processing. Um, we've, we've learned that um, discussing uh, the client's experience of the session and experience of the new competencies at the end of the session can integrate these uh, abilities in a different way um, and, and make them more powerfully uh, held in the body. 
Um, the other thing that metaprocessing does is you're asking somebody how they felt about the support you were giving. How was that for them to get support in a different way? And that also is an integration of the relationship and, and giving them a, pros, a time to reflect on and talk about what it's like to have this new experience with you. Yeah. And subsequently, we, what we've discovered is that metaprocessing can also bring to awareness developing competencies in other areas because uh, no um, one area of the body is completely separate from all the others. So as you feel better about yourself in one way, you may find you're feeling better about it yourself in other ways. Yeah, no. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some examples of some therapy sessions. And the first thing I'm going to talk about is need structure and therapy sessions with a need structure. And here we really, these pictures are really illustrative of developmental disruptions from both the early and from the late position. And the, in need structure, as I mentioned earlier, the child is really in a, in a uh, co-creation uh, with the caretaker, trying to figure out, can I get my needs met in a timely way? And these needs have to do with all these different, uh, very primary needs like sleeping, waking. Can I be soothed to go to sleep? Uh, can I get contact when I'm awake? Or can I be alone when I want to be alone? Um, eating, satiation, um, uh, contact, lack of contact, uh, stimulation versus relaxation. So all these are very primary needs. And if the caretaker is attuned enough, the needs are and the needs are met and in a good enough way we have resource but if not imagine that the mother's overwhelmed that she's overwhelmed with something outside of you um that she has a lot of other children that she has to uh, take care of maybe she's a working mother at the same time or maybe she just doesn't like being a mom and she leaves you alone a lot and doesn't pay too much attention to you that could go into an early need structure which is what we call is the despairing need structure. And what you can see in this baby is that pain and sort of pleading with their eyes, and, but not, ex, you know, that loss also of I, I need something and I'm not getting it. And that translates, if you look at the woman, into the collapse of the early need structure, that despair, that pain, that loneliness. And there's a collapse in the spine, there's a collapse in the chest. The lips are, are, uh, are very full, but don't seem to be getting a lot of sustenance. And that is really what early need structure look, can look like in an adult. The late need structure, we can see this baby. And that baby does, looks like she does not like what's going on. She's suspicious of it. She's not welcoming it. And suppose that happens a lot to her, that when she needs something, she gets something else that when she wants something, it's the wrong thing or the wrong time. And she gets used to people not being attuned to her, not all the time, but a lot of the time. So she becomes distrustful. And you can see this look in the adult of sort of a confusion and uh, like, what? Why, why am I getting this? That's, that's not what I need or that's not what I asked for. Or that's how I interpret it. But there's definitely a distrustful look in her eyes. And there's more rigidity and energy with the late need structure than the early need structure uh, in the adult. So the session I want to talk about was with a client um, I'll call Jackie. And Jackie was someone who I'd worked with for a while, and um, she had a birthday coming up and was very excited because she had told her boyfriend how much she wanted a certain purse from a certain store and uh, was very excited that he was, you know, she'd hoped he'd get it for her. And the, the big night came and she came in and I, the next week and I said, so how was your birthday, Jackie? And she, it was, it was very disappointing. You can see what's happening with my lips. And I said, well, well, Jackie, what happened? And she said, you know, I told you that I wanted this, this purse from this store. And I said, yeah. She said, well, my boyfriend took me out to dinner, you know, it was a nice restaurant, and he gave me the gift, and when I unwrapped it, you know what he had done? 
he hadn't gone to that store. He found a cheaper store, and he got the thing from a cheaper store. And he and I, and I was I was so disappointed. I told him what I wanted, and he was more interested in saving money than giving me the real thing. And I just I couldn't even say thank you, and I just withdrew for the rest of the night. And we went home. And actually, when I just saw my face, I looked like that that young woman down at the bottom right. I was like. Yeah, this wasn't this wasn't okay. So, of course, what I first did with em was empathize with Jackie. Said, "Gee, that must that I can really understand why that was disappointing, and that you were hurt because you were really clear about what you wanted." And and she said, "Yeah, you know, but you know, what can I expect? You know, I never get what I want." And I so I said, "Well, you know, we spent a little time with that." And I said, "Well, Jackie, you know, there's something I need to." talk to you about and she said well what and I said well I think you had a part in your disappointment she said what do you mean and she started to get a little distrustful of me and I said she's what do you mean how what I what part did I have I said what I wanted and then it didn't happen I said yeah but Jackie you were so set on it being exactly what you wanted that you didn't really notice what did happen. So I said, could, could we do an experiment? She said, she, she wasn't very happy with me at that point. She didn't know if she wanted to do an experiment. But I, I wanted her to use the, the muscle, the obicular oris, which is the muscle around the mouth. It's where, where infants take in nourishment, this deep, you know, t that's where they're taking in. So I said, okay, Jackie, just, just bear with me on this and let's just try this. Can you do this? She said, that's, why would I want to do that? I said, well, just because I think it might help you. Um, you know, she was still a little, you know, ornery with me. I said, well, just, let's, let's just, you know, just humor me and let's try this and see what happens. So she did this horse lips. A number of times until her lips started to soften. And then I said, okay, now I noticed, you know, also that, there's another movement I'd like you to try. And I said, Jackie, this is this movement, this stroking the pinky and pulling in. This is something that babies do when they're really taking in. They, you know, they're nursing or they're being fed with a bottle, but they're making contact with their mommy and they're doing this movement. And it's often when there's a lot of eye contact and they're taking in from their mouth, but they're also taking in with their hands they're really doing this little movement here. I said, I'd like you to remember when you opened the box and saw the purse and just try this. Just try doing this movement, Jackie. And she started to do it. And she was, she was imagining looking at the purse. And she, all of a sudden she said, oh, 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 he, he, actually, he actually did give me what I wanted. I said, yeah, Jackie, he did. See if you can take that in. And she, she stayed with it a little bit longer, and then she said, tears came to rise, and she said, you know, you know, I, I, always, I always thought I didn't deserve what I wanted. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, Jackie, I think, I think your boyfriend thinks you do deserve what you want. See if you can take that in, because he really wanted to give you what you wanted. So she stayed with this, and I said, do horse lips one more time. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> and really see that he really wanted to give this to you, and he really did give it to you. And she was able to relax and take it in for the first time. And I asked her, I said, Jackie, I, so how would it be if you went home and told him, told him what you realized today, that he actually had given you what you wanted? Maybe you could thank him. And she looked a little sheepish, but she said, you know, I think I want to do that. So she did, and th that sort of changed something big in her, in her relationship with him, but also something in her that she started to learn how to take things e even if they weren't exactly what you asked for. When someone makes an effort, you can get a lot of what you want. It's never perfect, but you can get a lot of what you want. And that was the beginning of a healing in her own very distrustful need structure.
Okay. And that's a wonderful uh, experience, and I'm I'm moved each time I hear it. Thank you. Um, I, actually, it was very moving when it happened. Okay, so then I'm going on to the next uh, case I want to talk about. The next example of of uh, of therapy, and this is from the will stage of development. And if we look at these pictures in the early, <laughs> this little girl's got such a great pout. You know, she's obviously disappointed, but she's, you know, she's sort of handling it, but she has to use a lot of energy to handle it. Because in will stage, when the kids, you know, when they're this age, when they're disappointed, they might not want to cry. So the first thing they do to not cry is, you know, they, they sort of tighten their, their, their lips and their jaw here, <laughs> like that. So she's trying not to cry. And her, you can see her shoulders are a little... Like she's taking something on while she's trying not to cry. And in the adult, you can see that same expression. There's a sort of disappointment look in her eyes. Her lips are, you know, sort of down. She's got that, it's like a, a little bit of a pout. Her shoulders are, look like they've really, you know, been carrying a lot. And there's this, a, a longing, but a, a also an apologetic look in her eyes. So that's sort of how that translates from that early childhood experience to the late one. Now, in will structure, what they're trying to do is come out with their intentions, and they're coming out with their plans, but if they end up having to self-sacrifice, as I said earlier, they can really get stuck in this role of being sort of this person who always self-sacrifices, and if there's a problem, they believe it's their fault. Here we have, in the lower picture, we have an example of a late will structure boy who's clearly really annoyed and really, you know, if I, if I was going to say, you know, what I thought was going on, he'd say, uh, what you did was stupid. I really don't like this. And a picture of a late uh, will structure man who's like, really, uh, what I'm imagining, and this is typical of will structure, it's like, it's your fault. You're the one that made this go this way, and I don't like you. Um, so that's a more blaming will structure. And what happens in the later in the later period? People get stuck in the role of uh, more persecutorial. If there's a problem, it's not me. It's over there. So I'd like to talk about a session I did with Amy. Um, as I said, this is when kids start to differentiate from their parents. But Amy didn't have that opportunity. She comes from an early well structured time. Her mom uh, worked very hard, long hours. And uh, her father was an alcoholic and was at home most of the time. And she was under his care when her mom was working at night. She was supposed to be taken, you know, being taken care of by him. But actually, she was doing a lot of caretaking of him because he'd get drunk and she'd try and pull him out of the bar and get them home. And it was, it was, it was just a very difficult situation. And she had worked with another body dynamic therapist earlier uh, um, but this, these issues came up again when she moved from that city to Los Angeles, where I live. Uh, and for, to, she moved because her husband had a great job offer and that he, that he really couldn't turn down. So they moved to Los Angeles. But in the process, she gave up all her contacts, her job, all the network that she had made in the city they used to live in. And she arrived in Los Angeles not knowing anybody. And after a year... She was pretty depressed, and she came in to see me, and she had really collapsed into this early self-sacrificing will structure. Basically, what she was doing was, and something she didn't want to do, she was, you know, taking care of the home, taking care of the dog, but not taking care of herself. And when she came in, we, you know, I, I could see that, and we started to work uh, with some of the muscles that have to do with, with will structure. Um, what we specifically worked with was her quadratus femoris, which is a centering muscle in the bottom of the butt, which is active when will structure is walking around um, and they can finally, when they're walking, they can change directions. So you can activate your quadratus femoris if you want to try it. If you sit on your sits bones, sit into the chair, rock into your sits bones, and if you tuck your tail, tuck your sacrum, you tuck your coccyx just a little bit, tuck your tail just a little, and your knees open up a little bit, um, that's when you're activating the quadratus femoris. And if you just do that a little bit, you might feel a muscle, the bottom of your butt, start to uh, have some tension in it. So I showed her that movement, 
And I had her do it a number of times till she started to sense it. And she started to feel like she had some more stuff, substance uh, in the bottom of her center, you know, in, in, in to, to support herself. And then I asked her to stand up and start to walk in my office. And when I, when I gave her a prompt, I asked her to change direction by orienting to something else in the room and pivoting on her toe and noticing that when she did that, she also would activate this quadratus femoris. Because actually the, the pivot on the big toe and, uh, and, and the quadratus femoris are both active in will structure when kids are pushing things around and they want to change direction or when they're starting to walk and they see something in the room they want to. They, they pivot on their toe and they use that quadratus femoris to push them off into the direction they want to go. So I had her walk around and change direction and then change direction and then change direction and then change direction. And she started to feel more energy in her body. Now, and then I asked her, I said, okay, let's, Amy, let's now think about something you'd like to do that's different than what you're doing. And she said, well, I don't want to be home all day. I said, good. So let's like walk and I want you to change direction to something you'd like to be doing, not just what you don't want to be doing. So she thought, she said, well, I'd like to start making contact with people in my field and maybe I could take a class. So I asked her to just imagine that you're going to change direction and move in the direction you want to go to take a class that, that would help you allow to meet people that could support you and also give you time to work on the things you like to work on. So she did that. She did that a number of times. And, and um, then lastly, I asked her to also notice that her, her shoulders, and we talked about this yoke that these two, this child and this, this uh, adult have in the upper picture of this sort of, this carrying this burden. I said, okay, Amy, I want you to just do this movement. And imagine you're just going to, like, when you do this, you're going to, like, take, get off of you this role you're stuck in of having to be the homemaker, having to make the meals all the time and not do anything for yourself. She was able to do that. And of course, I'm condensing this into, you know, just a few minute description. But doing that activated that the uh, muscle, the posterior deltoid, which were collapsed in both these, the, the young girl and the, the, um, the older woman. So she, in being able to change direction, she was using grounding and centering. And in using the posterior deltoid, she was, she was able to get unburdened of things. So she, she was able to work this out with her husband. She stopped being so depressed. She started taking a class at one of the uh, institutes here that really supported what she wanted to keep learning, but also made contacts with professionals in the area. And she felt really good and fairly quickly stopped therapy with me. What's interesting is that uh, uh, many months later, she called me and she was, she was really uh, very stuck. And she, she, had, she had had an um, a very severe allergy reaction to plants here that she hadn't been used to. And she had been, had a migraine for two weeks and been throwing up a lot. Um, and when she called me, she looked something like this. Let's see if I can do it. You can see it. Her shoulders were up by her ears and her mouth was really tense. And the, um, what she had said was that although the allergy attacks had stopped, the, the whole experience had really um, activated her uh, a neck injury that she had. So I said, well, Amy, I can see that you're really using your will structure because the fact of the matter is when we're very stressed, we do use our will structure. We do like tighten up those shoulders. We might tighten up our jaw. We might like push ourselves through things. And it's a resource that we have when we need it. Um, however, she got stuck in it. So I said, uh, I'd like to try something with you. And she was willing. I said, I'd like you to try yawning. So I, I taught her this movement. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, she laughed. Mm. Um, but if you, if you do that, you can stimulate yawns. If you, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can involuntarily stimulate yawns. And the more she yawned, the more her jaw started to relax, her shoulders started to relax, the diaphragm started to relax. And what happened was the tension in her neck that she'd been carrying disappeared. And she was so happy that happened. And uh, I, I got an email from her uh, a couple of weeks later and said, she said it had not returned, although she had kept yawning 
um, throughout the two weeks, you know, a couple times a day. So that's just an example of working with specific muscles that hold you in the developmental stage where there's a problem and that when you use those muscles, things can change and you can become more resourced. Okay. So, Anne, I have a question. Yeah. Um, you've talked a lot about the muscles, uh -huh. some of the muscle interventions that you'd use in order to uh, build the resources. I'm wondering if in either of these cases you could talk about the messaging aspect of it, what you might have said over the course of your relationship to either the Jackie or I'm forgetting the other person. Amy, Amy or Jackie. Amy or Jackie. So you can illustrate what you mean when you say, talk about the messaging. Okay. So I'll, I'll stick with uh, Amy right now because I'm right here. I'll go back to Jackie. So, so with Amy, what I what I'm, uh, was saying to her was, I get it's really hard. And I know that you've really, you really care about your husband. And, and you might be afraid that if you take care of yourself and don't take care of him, there'll be some sort of problem in the relationship. She said, yeah, I'm pretty sure he won't like it. And I said, but when you lived in this other city, did he have any objection to the fact that that you were um, that you had your own you had your own life that was more separate? And she said, "No." I said, "So, I think it's important to understand that he's not requiring that you sacrifice yourself in this way for him. You just sort of gotten stuck here. So, what I would hope is that you can remember what it was like when you felt more separate and you weren't just taking care of him." And then when she was able to do that, because, of course, this work took a few sessions, I, when she came in, I said, I'm, I'm so happy for you that you found out that you can do things for yourself and you still keep the connection with your husband. And I'm really happy that you are relying on me to give you the support to do this. Because it's actually, it's really fun for me to see that you, that you are doing this for yourself and that you have connection with your husband and that, that our connection is also deepening. Is that? I see. Yeah, so you're, you're actually sort of standing in for the parent or what the parental message might have been and, and giving them a chance to experience it. Sure, yeah. sure. I'm giving them the message is that, that had been absent. Uh -huh. But yes. I'm actually, I'm doing it in a very authentic way because I really need it. I'm always yeah. happy when these things happen. Now with, with Jackie, who had that late need, with the later structures, with the later position in each developmental stage, part of what's needed is to confront, because the, there's more energy in this protection and this defense, you have to confront them a little bit. So as much as I wanted to empathize with, with uh, uh, Jackie and her disappointment, I also knew that she needed to learn that something she was continuing to do, unconsciously, but something she was continuing to do was part of why things got spoiled so much for her. Because she was often disappointed with not just her boyfriend and his actions, but with friends, with teachers, with me, with whoever. Because if it wasn't quite right, if it wasn't exactly what she thought she needed or didn't come at the time, or for instance, if she had to tell someone what she needed, and then it, even then it could be disappointing. I had to confront her and say, Jackie, I know it's disappointing. And actually, I'm sure that what happened to you when you're younger is that you often didn't get what you wanted and needed. And you, as, you, as you said to me in this session, you thought you didn't deserve it. But it doesn't have to do with what you deserve or don't deserve, Jackie. Right now it has to do with when it's there, can you take it in? So that's more like confronting the protection, supporting her to do that, giving her that little push that she needs and teaching her actually how to do it. Does that answer that question? Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, if you want to learn more about body dynamics or about the work we're doing, we're going to replay this, this webinar uh, and we'll tell you about it in your follow up email. We'll give you the link. You can also come to our website, which is bodynamicusa.com. And we do have uh, three trainings coming up. They're, all the trainings, the, the uh, healing developmental disruption trainings, are four workshops over 17 days. And the workshops, the first one is a five-day workshop because we 
teach you the overall um, structure and then we do two developmental stages and then we have three workshops which are four days each in northern california the next one is starting october 20th and it's in the san francisco bay area in in berkeley actually we're starting one in vancouver in march 2017 and we'll be doing one in new york but right now we don't have the dates yeah so i'd uh, like to say that the uh the workshops the training is very focused on people using the work and after the first five days um, uh, quite a few of the therapists are bringing the work into their own practice and giving good body dynamic sessions to their clients right and and what happens oh <laughs> oh uh, <laughs> so you're giving sessions right away. You're giving sessions after the first three days. You'll be working with the existence because we start with the existence level, um, existence time. And then before the, in the next two days, you'll also be uh, seeing demonstration sessions of need structure and then giving sessions uh, in, in triads of need structure sessions. So you're starting to use the muscles and understand the theory and getting supervised uh, sessions right away. Okay. Are there questions? Okay, so yeah, we're moving into the Q&A section of this conversation and we do have a few questions coming in. So okay. um, <clears throat> one question coming in is, can you explain again what you mean by metaprocessing? Uh, well, let me start in and you come in, okay? Uh, metaprocessing is um, not so much doing the work itself, but discussing what happened in the session, how it was for the person to be related to and the ways you, they, you related to them, how it was for them to uh, sense the new competency, how it was to be able to see that they can act differently in the future. So and you're talking about it, and that's a different way of taking it in. They're not just having experienced it, but now they are acknowledging it and communicating it uh, with another person. and that, sort of, um, I think it centers it in a different part of the brain, which also accelerates um, the uh, integration. Integration, thank you. And, and when we're metaprocessing, we're actually observing ourselves. So, uh, and you're observing yourself in terms of what you just did, in terms of what happened in the session, but you're also observing uh, and talking about how it is to be with the therapist and be relating in this way. So this is, you know, part of uh, metaprocessing is really talking about the relationship. So that's part of the healing is for people to observe and recognize that they are doing something different, but also the relationship is really different than what they're used to. Okay, so I have another question that came in from Akash, who wants to know, how is this work different from shock trauma? Okay, so in shock trauma, you're dealing with the involuntary nervous system. You're trying to get people uh, out of the fight, fight, freeze response. Um, and so that, that's a very different kind of work. You're working more energetically um, and you're not using the voluntary muscles in the same way that we are. Um, so what we do is work with the muscles that, have, that correspond to uh, the time and the time and development where these di disruptions happened, um, the and the uh, specific muscles that have to do with the issue the person is working on. So it's working with the voluntary nervous system, and shock trauma is working with the automatic nervous system, which we don't autonomic sorry autonomic nervous system, which we don't have conscious control of. We do have conscious control over the voluntary nervous system, specifically the muscles. Anything you want to add to that, Joel? Uh, no, I think Ann covered it well. Uh, um, it's a different process, really. And there's, with working with shock, you have to do a little bit at a time. You have to titrate, uh, and you're not particularly teaching new abilities. Okay, so another user wants to know, um, do you guys have all the muscles memorized? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
not, I mean, I sort of know, at this point I know anatomy and know where the muscles are, but I often have, you know, every now and then I have to look up, okay, wait a minute, which, which is the centering muscle for this, or what is that muscle, what stage is that muscle uh, come into voluntary use for? Um, but, you know, these are things that are easily accessible uh, in, you know, to look up and you don't need to know all the muscles. What we're yeah. teaching is you don't need to know all the muscles. That's um, what we've done is really break it down and make it easier. We have uh, teach five or six muscles for each developmental stage and we have all the information on one sheet of paper for that stage. So people can refer to it before or during a session with their own clients. So we always teach centering. We always teach grounding for each developmental stage. We always teach support. What are the support muscles for that stage? And then we pick a few muscles that are really pertinent to the theme of that developmental stage that most exemplify what the child has been trying to learn and didn't learn. Okay, let's see. Uh, another question just came in that says, John Downs is asking, this sounds like it could be effective across all cultures. Is that so? Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. To... I mean, as you, oh, go on, Joel. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, as we said, the Danes really studied how a child learns to move and the developmental movements and the psychological abilities that accompany it. And this is a universal, it, in some cultures, uh, different, uh, um, developmental stages are easier. In some cultures, they're harder. So there are differences between cultures in that. Um, in the United States, for example, there's a lot of existence issues. Uh, in Mexico, there might be more um, uh, rule structure issues. In Asian cultures, sometimes there's need structure issues. So, but basically, the stages are the same and. As we saw earlier in the map of where it's been taught, it's never been a, a question that, oh, this doesn't apply here. So I, I would add on to that, that uh, there are cultural differences. So, so it's not about um, that all cultures uh, support like the free expression of whatever. Um, for instance, uh, the uh, solidarity performance uh, character structure. Um, uh, some cultures very much do not think and are unhappy if someone tries to be the boss or be the leader or be the head or whatever. And uh, they, they're much more interested in making sure that everybody has an equal uh, say in what's going on or, or learns, everybody learns what needs to be learned. Um, and that's certainly not true in our culture. We're a much more competitive culture where the person who uh, can do something the best is, is, uh, uh, given a lot more attention than the person who is learning to do it. Yeah, and uh, it, one example of this is the uh, solidarity performance stage. Well, in Denmark, as I sort of said before, uh, the founders of Bodynamics, a dozen people worked together for 20 years. They shared income at times. Uh, they would go out and uh, send one person to study something if they thought it was needed in their, in their work. So they cooperated in a way that allowed this theory to be built from many sides by many people. And that's different than what we have mostly in the States. Usually things are the, the development of one person who has some good ideas and then a practice grows up around that. Yeah. Okay. okay. The question that just came in that I can't see what it is. So let me read it to you. Simone okay. Block is asking, <clears throat> Um, you say you teach centering, grounding, and something else at each stage. Was it support or what? It, was, it is support. It's like what muscles um, are the most uh, active and, and uh, in, in terms of the movements, what muscles can do you touch for a child to feel support and then that they can use to, to uh, allow themselves to be supported, you know, when they're alone. So, you know, the, for instance, uh, for the uh, will structure, there's a place on the back that we uh, would, if, if with someone's permission, put our hand, which is right below the shoulder blades on a muscle called the latissimus. 
It's a muscle that's active in will stage. It's how they start to be able to support themselves also. They, they have a little more structure in their back because the latissimus has become active. But in the early uh, position of the self-sacrificing, that muscle is not active. So there's a collapse right around behind the diaphragm, right in the back, right at the latissimus. And so teaching someone how to use that muscle, for, for instance, in will structure, uh, is, is a way to start to get, have them help to support themselves to do the things they want to do with their will. I hope that answers that question. So then Kokoliko Giland asks uh, for a link to a Facebook recording, please. So, um, yes, well, you can do Yeah, that. On our website, we have a, a Facebook page. And on that Facebook page, there is another link to another recording. And then Simone Block asked, this was answered in text, but I think for everybody's uh, sake, she wants to know where in Berkeley the training is going to be? Uh, it's at the Rudger Mondier Center, which is uh, uh, near uh, University Avenue and near San Pablo Avenue. Okay. Um, oh, here's another question. Let's see. <coughs> this came in through chat. You mentioned that there are three possible positions for each stage. One is underdeveloped, another is rigid and controlled, right? But what is the third? Can you explain these more? Resourced. Uh, resourced, the healthy yeah. position. That's the third one, is someone really knows how to do something. Someone's very skilled at something. So that's the resource is the, what we call the healthy position. The, the collapsed or not learned or given up is the early position. And the late position is the rigid or held back. And this is from Sosto, the same user, asking, if you do muscle work for the underdeveloped and stretching for the overdeveloped, in what ways do you work with the third position? Well, uh, the third position is really uh, the muscle has a neutral elasticity for the healthy position. But you may have to help a person to uh, own and accept that they have the abilities that they may not realize they do have and don't use them as much as they could. So for instance, I had a client that uh, um, uh, came in and told me how she didn't feel very smart uh, she, and she had a whole history around um, uh, her older, older si adopted sisters and, and uh, parents were both academics and her older sisters were uh, you know, considerably older than she was and she always felt like she wasn't very smart when they would have discussions at the dinner table. So she thought she couldn't make opinions, she couldn't form opinions, and I pointed out to her that in this, she had, I forget what she had been talking to me about, but she had talked about some, some group that she was involved with, and she had a lot of opinions about what was going on in the group, what was good, what needed to be supported more, what needed to be developed, what was not so good. And I pointed that out to her. She's, she was, you know, she was more articulate than she thought, and over time, as we've worked together, she's become really clear about what she thinks, and she doesn't hold back. Uh, and she's really integrated that she's a lot smarter than she originally thought, and that her opinions are pretty solid. She's pretty grounded and pretty centered. Okay, here's a good question that just came in from someone anonymously, mm -hmm. wanting to know how do emotion, how does I think emotional processing enter into your work? Oh. oh. Well, we, we didn't say much about that. Yeah, time. well, it happens all the time. Yeah. Um, it happens when people are having strong feelings about what they don't know, when there's pain or loss, or the, the things that happen that were really ruptures for them. There's feelings about that. Sometimes it can be anger. Sometimes it can be fear. And, you know, I think we don't talk about that as much because one of our first trainings was in emotional... Yeah release work, so we're very comfortable dealing with a lot of expression and deep expression of emotions. Like, for instance, sometimes for will structure, for the late will structure, it would be really important for them to come out with their power strongly and being met, being really supported with all that energy and really come out and say what they mean and say how they feel and be met. And to, and to do that, you have to have that kind of energy yourself. Or... Uh, did, were you going to say something, Joel? Yeah, I was just saying, uh, you know, often uh, the, when the person is realizing that they're uh, 
gaining the sense of competency, it produces an emotional reaction, and we certainly go and support that emotional reaction. And one of the things I think we're actually fairly skilled at is noticing when there's just inklings, just you know, small uh, indications that there's emotion there, and we'll say, okay, just notice what's happening now, and let's give it lots of space. You know, I'm laughing because we did the uh, a healthy structure thing. It's so co- it's so ingrained in us to work with this that we forgot to mention it. Yeah, but it's really creating the space for someone to allow the feelings, which is part of letting go of the past or part of being moved in the present and really allowing that and being met with that. So... Um, John Downs asking again and thanking you for your previous answer. Are there any client populations you would not use biodynamics with? Client populations. Um, well, I could say one thing. Uh, we've talked about using the muscles and stuff. Of course, we're very uh, selective or careful about who we would touch. We'd have permission. There are certain kinds of uh, situations and clients we would never touch at all but we can have people uh stretch or put tension in a muscle without touching them so that's that's uh that's a possibility too but when we think of client populations someone who isn't ready to deal with their body so we wouldn't use their body we we'd ask them to start to develop body awareness but we'd be very slow about approaching that um uh when we have someone who has a lot of borderline tendencies, again, you move very slowly. Uh, you meet them where they can be met, but a lot of what you're going to be teaching them is how to contain themselves, how to be able to tolerate feeling, how to be centered and grounded instead of just going off. And that, that, can, that can be a long piece of work. Um, and it would be something where there'd be less, um, you know, reliance on, on the... Uh, using the muscles and more reliance on the relationship and slowly introducing using some of the uh, muscles for containment and structure, building, building structure. So this will be the last question. Oh, two more. Okay, these last two, and then we'll be at time. Um, <clears throat> so John is also asking, what about someone who has muscular issues like MS or CP? Okay, so I've actually worked with someone who had pretty strong uh, effects from CP. And I was able to, you know, she, she, she couldn't speak, but she was able to access some of her muscles. And she was a very emotional uh, person. And one of the things I asked her to do was to start to learn to contain some of those emotions rather than, uh, and, and I, I also, you know, met her with my um, compassion for what it felt like to be in her body and not be able to express herself. And, and when she was in social situations, by the time she could type out what she needed to say to people, how hard that was, because the conversation was moving on. But that there were certain kinds ways of her expressing her frustration that actually were making people pull away from her. And I tried to you know, use some of the muscles uh, to help her contain some of that. Uh, and then to also allow herself to feel some of the emotion with me. Um, so to have worked with someone like that. Um, but if someone had no use of any of their muscles, we could still use the developmental stages and the character levels and uh, do some psychoeducation around um, what wasn't learned and give them support around that. And we can also, you know, if, they're, if it's okay with them, we can touch them where they need support. And one last question from Simone. Do you work with children? Uh, I don't work with children, but we know people who do, and we train plenty of people who do. Yes, um, I don't work with children either. I have in the past, but now I'm working mainly with adults, and, and yet this work is very applicable for children. And as, as Joel was saying earlier, um, it's being taught in schools in Austin and um, other people who have trained with us have taken it to work with children in their own private practices. It's a great developmental, I mean, it's really so much information for people to understand child development in this way. And a lot of compassion, a lot of compassion. 
So um, if you have more questions that you didn't get to ask, you are welcome to go to the Bodynamics USA website and email your questions to Ann yes. and Joel. Definitely. Um, yeah, you can also find out information about the training, and there will be a link, as I said, to replay this webinar, both in the follow-up email, and we'll try to get that on Facebook as well. So thank you so much, everyone, for, mm -hmm. for joining us and participating with us. It's so exciting to be getting this work out and uh, that so many people were interested, and uh, I hope to see some of you at the training. Yes, yes. Definitely. Thank you I'd all like for coming. To say, uh, thank you, Laura. Yeah, thank, thank you, Laura. Thank you, Akash. This stuff and Akash thank you, and, Jonathan. And Paula and Jonathan, yeah. colleagues who've helped us to put this together. Yeah. Thank very, you all. Very welcome. Thank you. Thank you for everything you're bringing to the work and to the world. Thank you, Laura. Thank you.